Okay, so I had a whole plan this Sunday to film this Q&A during the day, but then I found myself four Bloody Marys deep at a dive bar. Vlog. I just wanted to quickly pop in here and take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, which is Monica Vinner. So a little bit about this brand. It is a sustainable jewelry brand. All of the pieces are made with 100% recycled 18 karat gold and silver. Also all the beautiful packaging that the pieces come in is made from recycled materials. They also have a really incredible repair and rewear program. This brand is really dedicated to you having amazing pieces that last a long time, which I think speaks volumes to their brand, the quality and just their mission. So I just wanted to close up show you guys some of the necklaces that I'm wearing. This blue charm is absolutely one of my favorite pieces from this whole collection. It's just so pretty. And then this little heart and then a little diamond stone. I feel like that's like the perfect stack. Also, both of these rings are from them. The best way for me to describe this brand or when I think of this brand, I think of really special jewelry and special pieces, which I think makes for really the best gift. So that being said, if you guys want to shop some of their pieces for the holidays, I'm going to leave you with a link and a discount code. My code is page 20 for 20% 20 off your order. So I thought I would just sit down and film this video for you guys. It's not gonna be my longest video. I actually already uploaded, some of you might know this if you're subscribed, um, but I already uploaded my weekly vlog. In a perfect world, I would upload, and I guess I am this week, upload a weekly vlog and like a sit down, whether it's talking, chatting, Q and A, cooking, like specific cooking segment or makeup. I'm also filming with a ring light right now and it's kind of weird, but I'm gonna have a glass of wine because I'm already hungover from my other drinks. Ooh, we never do this. Never. Ever, have we ever done this? Yeah, maybe like once. Oh, we're so cute. Cheers. Okay, guys. Anyways, we're going to have a little wine and I'm going to eat pizza and I'm going to answer some of your guys' questions that you asked me. And I asked you guys to make the questions social media based. I think having a theme with these Q&As makes them ha like a little bit more intentional. Before I get into the Q&A, I just want to say last night I was going through some of my old YouTube videos just to like peek through them. It's kind of like a digital journal and I realized how many videos I've archived. Like all of my first videos I ever made, I archived. Um, and I kind of wish I didn't do that, but now I can't. It's not like Instagram where you can like archive something and then bring it back. They're just like gone. Someone asked, how do you decide rates for your content creation? There is a sort of industry standard. It's mostly not about how many followers you have on Instagram because there can be someone with one or two million followers but gets 20,000 views on their story. And although 20,000 people is a lot of people, um, what brands really want to see is how many followers you have versus how many people are engaging and watching your content. A big part of my media kit, which is like my data analytics kit that gets sent to brands is link clicks and sale conversions. So it's kind of like a mix of a bunch of different things. It's really not just like one analytic that um, allows you to have a certain rate. Also based off personal experience, my rate has gone up as I've gotten older, as I've kind of like proven myself in the industry. You kind of have to make your way in the industry as an influencer. You have to take smaller brand deals. You have to really show brands what you can create and then you can start charging like a real premium. But I feel like there's a rites of passage to charging a certain amount per post. But my manager has decided and negotiated all of my deals and all of my rates and she gets a percentage of the deals. And I actually recently signed with an agent, which is really, really exciting. This year, we kind of knew that I was going to be signing with an agency. There's definitely the right time in your career as a, especially a digital creator, to sign with an agency. Personally, with my personal specific goals, and things I want to do. We decided that this year was a good year for me to start interviewing different agencies. So I interviewed with all of the agencies, all of the big ones, and I actually just signed with WME, which is a huge 
I guess milestone for my career and a lot of people might not even know what that is it's just a big agency so now my brand deals and my team is gonna change a little bit still gonna have my manager who I've had for years I love her we just like make a really good team she knows me really well um, but now WME is going to be doing my negotiation pitching brand deals and then they're gonna be sending that to my manager to get it executed and with signing with an agency for me it was more just taking the next step in my career and aligning myself with bigger brands bigger opportunities and you guys will be seeing a lot of those things like through my youtube and through just like things that come out a really cool part about wme wme owns img tennis which is a huge tennis agency and they just have really good connections within tennis so I'm really excited about that aspect of um, the, like the connections that I will acquire through having them be my new team. Do you have a personal assistant? How do you manage all of it? Um, so I used to have a personal assistant, Olivia, who you guys might know just through my YouTube. And then she actually kind of like grew out of the position really naturally. Um, she's a really hard worker. She's really motivated. And she started helping me with also Dairy Boy and then kind of just like fell into a new role at my company which is Dairy Boy and I was really excited to like have that transition happen for her because we always kind of like knew that her long-term position probably wasn't going to be my assistant whether it was her working in the industry in a different way. I do have someone helping me right now with my admin computer stuff and my calendar but I'm in the process of hiring a new assistant. I'm actually going to be hiring a executive assistant for Dairy Boy and for Paige Lorenz like my, both brands. They can just help me with my overall calendar because a lot of the times now because I'm so busy with Dairy Boy things will like overlap so I need someone who knows both of my calendars and then it could just like all flow and work really well like literally in the process now of doing interviews and figuring that out I kind of needed to figure out where I was gonna be and like where my Dairy Boy headquarters was gonna be before I decided like what exactly I needed from an assistant I also really like working with people long term and I like just like having them really become a part of my life it's a very intimate industry and I think that's just like the best way to do it. Someone goes, how do you plan your YouTube videos? Do you plan them out mentally? It kind of depends on the week, honestly, and where I am. At tennis tournaments, I would say I try to get or I'm conscious about certain shots that I'm getting, whether it's, you know, I don't know. Like when I go to these tournaments and when I'm there supporting Tommy, naturally, the vlog always comes second. So I found that in the beginning of vlogging, kind of like the ATP tour stuff, I would go to matches and be focused on Tommy and like what the day is around him. Also tennis is like a very intense sport, so I'm pretty locked in on the matches. I would forget to film content on site. I would forget to film content at his matches. I would just like kind of run to his matches and not think about vlogging at all. It's good for me to have a sort of plan in my notes of shots that I know that I want things I know I want to include, especially if I'm in a specific place, um, whether that's including something that's in the area. Um, but I just have like a brief, brief um, outline of what I want to include in each vlog. If a vlog from the week before was super chatty, then I maybe will switch it up on the next one. I, I found that if I map out my vlogs a little bit more prior to filming, I can hold myself a little bit more accountable for the shots that I want, like a shot list. Um, whether that's certain shots it matches and I get them done and then I put my phone away Put my camera away so I can just be there and be present. I think that's just like part of um, Learning how to integrate YouTube and vlogs into your life in a healthy way Sometimes I do have to become a little bit more creative with the home vlogs, which are honestly you guys know like my favorite vlogs at home um, there's less going on. So at the tennis matches, I'm in a major city for the most part. I'm in a new place. It's interesting. There's always something to film. There's always a match to go to. There's always like new outfits. So I feel like at tournaments, it's much easier. Like it's not as hard to create interesting content because you're like in a place that's already interesting and the place kind of speaks for itself but i find myself having to be a lot more creative and plan out the vlogs more and make like little movies 
when I'm home. And those are honestly my favorite videos, like kind of turning a day that's like not much going on into something special and like beautiful through filming, whether it's like my very mundane morning routine or going to the beach for the sunrise. I kind of like the more chill style in general, like me as a viewer and also me as like a film person, someone who makes videos for a living. I think I have like really found my own niche in travel content. Um, and I really have like loved my recent travel videos. Someone asked, what's my coffee order? So I actually prefer making coffee at home and I like cold brew, just like a medium roast cold brew with whole milk and brown sugar. What was your first job after college? So a lot of people don't know this, I don't think about me, or some people might, but I worked all throughout college. But I worked in Soho as a stylist for two years, worked in another retail store. What did I do? I had like a lot of really fun jobs. Should I tell them about Insomnia Cookie? Oh, you have to tell them. My favorite thing about Paige. This is your favorite thing about me? Yeah. So I went to Yukon College for one semester my freshman year. So long story short, I was ski racing in high school and my college, my, sorry, my high school didn't have grades. So we didn't have any grades because most kids got into school for skiing and then I quit skiing while I was at the high school, like fucking quit. I was like, I'm done, I'm not doing this. So I didn't have grades. So all of the colleges that I wanted to go to and all the colleges that I was interested in were like, girl, you didn't have any fucking grades. We don't know what type of student you are. So I had to go to, or like the smartest idea in my head, I got into Yukon. I'm from Connecticut, Connecticut resident. So it was really cheap for me to go to school for a semester at Yukon and I could just like do really well, be close to home, whatever. Went to Yukon and I wanted to have a job. I wanted to work and I wanted to make money. I've always been like very money driven and I've always like wanted to work and have my own money. And I decided because I liked Insomnia Cookie so much that that's where I needed to work. And um, so I worked at Insomnia Cookie for like two weeks. Oh, I didn't know it was just two yeah, weeks. Yeah, two weeks. That was the shortest job I've ever had. Um, I was really excited about it. Um, you got free cookies. Um, that wasn't the most positive experience. I honestly got made fun of which is really fucking sad. I got made fun of from girls my age uh, that I had classes with and I was driving my dad's old car. I was delivering cookies in this nice car with like the thing on top of the car and people would one, not tip me because I think they think I had money because I was driving a nice car and then I would just get straight up bullied and made fun of. Um, girls would laugh at me they would be like, Paige, and like scoff and laugh. I delivered to like sororities and fraternities, laughed at, um, so I quit. But I still have the t-shirts from working there, which I think is like kind of iconic. But anyways, Insomnia Cookie transferred to school in New York City, and then I always worked in college. Um, I love working, I love making my own money, I love a paycheck, so yeah. Always working, always like had an internship. Through working retail in Soho, there were a lot of photographers and this was before the TikTok influencer. Um, there was just a lot of girls doing like Tezza, I don't know if you guys remember that whole influencer era, girls doing street style outfit photography stuff. And I started posting um, like outfit style content um, and shooting with photographers. And then I gained like 10,000 followers on Instagram in college and then it kind of just like kept growing from there. But it was cool. It was cool to be an influencer, I guess, or like be in the space before it really changed. Not to say that it's bad now. It just like it started from a creative place and it started from a place of me collaborating with a lot of cool photographers and um, it was just like more like the Tumblr era, but yeah. The coolest place I ever worked was probably this ski shop called Westerland in Nolita. And it was a really cool Swedish Japanese outdoor gear store. And I, I wanted to work there because I was having a hard time finding people that liked to do stuff outside when I was living in Manhattan. Like a lot of people wanted to club or shop. And um, 
I just like wanted people that had similar interests to me. And this is something that I recommend for anyone watching this. If you're struggling making friends or if you're new in a city, go work somewhere. Either it's like a restaurant you really love and a part of town you really love or a store that sells something that's like a niche to you. Like it was a skiing outdoor shop and that was my whole life prior to moving to New York. So I met a lot of really like-minded, really interesting, cool people that I'm still friends with to this day. Do you edit content the same day you make it? You have such a quick turnaround. That honestly depends on how good I am at editing, getting up um, content today. This is gonna be edited and live the day that I film it, which is not my preference. I don't like doing that. I like having videos honestly like stacked in the queue to go live. Um, as a content creator who edits all of their own YouTube content, which is really rare. I don't know if a lot of you guys know that, but no shame to anyone else who has a video editor. I totally understand and respect it. A lot of people aren't interested in it, don't really know how to do it. But for me, be like my videos unless I edited it. I think it, it gives my personal touch to the videos. Um, and I'm just very specific about what... I want in my videos and how I want it done creatively. So I think if you make YouTube videos and you're not worried about the creative side of it, um, then an editor is great. That makes sense. Things you used to do as a content creator that you don't do now. This is a great question. The thing that comes to my mind like immediately when I think about things that I like cringe at myself about that I used to do are crazy um face filters um like morphing face filters okay i'm gonna insert what i'm talking about um and this is not to say that i don't like edit my photos sometimes that's not true at all it's more these crazy face blurring like eye tilting lip plumping skin smoothing um filters on stories are a huge turnoff to brands and a lot of creators don't know this so maybe if you're a creator and you're seeing this i don't think a lot of girls use them anymore um i feel like they used to be really big when i was using them they were really big um but one it completely dilutes the quality of the video obviously it's like a very filtered crazy like filtered video um but it also just like isn't it's just not like real and live and I think stories should be like pretty raw like I think you can obviously add like a nice aesthetic filter over it but I think it's just like a really big turnoff to brands I don't think brands care if you're like blurring your skin slightly or like removing a zit or like whatever on Facetune I don't think that's a very big deal um obviously you don't want to overdo it there, there was definitely a time where I was way over editing my photos and I, and I honestly didn't even look like myself like I, I look back at photos and I'm like what the fuck was I doing to my face anyways I think we've all had like a horrible face tune era um and it's okay it's okay to have a face tune horrible face tune era so yeah that's something that I definitely cringe at myself like I can't even believe I used filters like that and like thought that I ate with them. I'm trying to think of other things I did. I mean, I don't know, like it's really hard to avoid being cringy as a content creator. Like you just can't avoid it. Um, you just can't avoid it. But obviously like I started when I was 20. So the tw like 20 through 23 is like the gnarliest period of time ever. So yeah, there was tons of shit that I did that was like, that was like cringe. But I do like miss a little bit, and I was thinking about this the other day. I miss the version of myself online that was just super, um, maybe like I showed a little bit more of my personality and I was a little bit more unfiltered in like a good way, not like a bad unfiltered way. I think I'm just like less willing to show off that side of myself, which I really, shouldn't be worried or scared about because regardless even when i share a more dull down watered down version of myself i still get hate so it really shouldn't matter um but it's something i'm getting more comfortable with even when i shared in my last vlog or i've actually shared twice now um in my nantucket vlog and then in my last vlog about my social anxiety and it was like a 30 second clip about like very briefly talking about how i have social anxiety and i got like 50 comments from girls being like thank you for talking about this and i was like oh my gosh i barely talked about it and i think it made a lot of people feel better 
um, and like not alone. And it made me feel really good to open up about that and then get a bunch of girls, like I'm not happy that you're feeling the same way, but feeling like we're in this together. And I think there is something rewarding and, a, and positive about being vulnerable and sharing. Um, so it's something that I'm definitely working on because social anxiety is not the only thing that I struggle with. What are some things that you've manifested into your life? I'm not someone who sits and tries to like manifest things. I definitely have like prayed for things in my life. I pray for like larger things. Like I don't necessarily always pray for specific things. Um, usually like happiness, health, and success in what I'm doing, but you can literally pray all you want and try to manifest things all you want, but if you're not willing to put in the work and do what needs to be done to reach your goals, you're just never gonna get there and no one can do that for you. I wouldn't say like manifested, but I definitely hoped and prayed and put in the work and there are still a lot of things that I wanna do and um, things I even wanna change. And I know that if I'm working hard, being a good person, continuing to like build the relationships that I have in the industry and maintain those relationships. And yeah, that I know that I'll be good regardless um, because I have a good family, I have a good boyfriend, I have great friends and I just now need to like put in the work and stay consistent. I don't know, like YouTube for me was a big goal, um, growing my YouTube, creating my YouTube into something that I'm really proud of. And no matter what I try to like manifest or pray for, the only one that was gonna make that happen was me. Don't you think that's true? Like not relying too much on like hoping that shit happens, like you have to kind of be a go-getter. Yeah, 100% in anything that you wanna be great at. Yeah, like if you wanna be great, it doesn't, I think that Praying, being grateful, hoping, being hopeful, being a dreamer is such a good thing, but at the end of the day, so much of things in life, good things in life come from hard work. And everyone's hard work looks really different. But I think surrounding yourself with hardworking people, good people, hardworking people, is really helpful. Because I think you are who you hang out with in a lot of ways. Okay guys, Tommy's gonna take over and ask me some questions. Tommy, uh, when I first like got here, told me that this was really good pizza, and I like didn't believe him. So I was like, "There's no way, pizza in Florida." What do you call it? I call it Zumi's Pizza. All right, I like this question because it's my favorite hairstyle of yours. How do you do your crimpy beachy curls? Mmm, you do love that hair on me. Yeah. Um, I have beachy, wavy, natural hair. Like that's my natural texture is like a little bit of a beachy wave. I let it air dry. And then I obviously have some extensions in. So a lot of the times the extensions are that, um, like a little wavy. I'll let it all air dry and I'll put two clips in the front to like keep my front pieces down. And then I'll go in with a barrel waver on the inside so like a curl on the inside and then the, the beach wave around the outside. So it like creates volume. So yeah. As I thought I would be drunk in this video and I'm not. Which is probably a good thing, but. Next tattoo ideas. Ooh. I have, in my old age, realized that like, I think I'm all set with the tattoos, which is really painful for me to say because my mom obviously was always like, you're not gonna want these when you're older. I don't regret any of them. Maybe like two of them. <laughs> this pizza is so good. Oh, I wanna answer this question. Let me ask it. Is it better to do small brand deals or hold out till you have a bigger following and do larger? I was taking everything that I got and I think that's really important to do. I mean, obviously some brands you shouldn't do. Like maybe not a lot of fast fashion brands, but I was taking everything and I was doing stuff for free. It's really important to build brand relationships and when you show people that you're making content for brands, it will appeal to other brands. So yes, take everything in the beginning, even if it doesn't pay well. At least that's what I did. 
Do you ever experience creative ruts? How do you deal with them? I have not yet run into that problem. I'm really grateful to have such a busy kind of, my life isn't crazy, but I think a lot of people, it's a very, what's the word? I have so much going on and I have so many parts of my life that I love sharing and connecting with you guys. So even if I don't have much going on in the week, I know I can always cook, make a home video. I don't feel pressure to make like overly crazy entertaining content. So I don't, but I might. Um, you know, I upload one video or two videos a week. So it's a lot of videos. So hopefully I'll be able to continue to feel inspired and creative by my videos and I also think it's okay to have videos be similar. I think that's totally fine. How do you know when it's right to move in with your partner? Oh. Um, I think living with someone is the only way to really get to know someone really well. With, like I'm talking marriage. Yeah, yeah. I've always said like You got to live with think, them. I think you got to live with someone for at least a year before you get married. Yeah, totally agree. I think that, and this might not be the answer that someone wants, but I think if you're even questioning if it's right, it's probably not. Every situation in my life that I've had a bad gut feeling about something or a decision I've had a bad gut feeling about is usually always ended up not well. So I think um, trust yourself and trust your gut or ask people that you love around you um, for advice, because I'm sure you have like family and friends that are honest with you about if they like your partner or not, or if it's a good choice. Um, I also think that on the other side of that, some things need to be learned through experience. So living with someone and having it not work out can be just as valuable because you'll figure out more what you want in a partner. And I think it's valuable to have those life experiences. Wait, I want to read the ADHD question. You've mentioned you have ADHD. Tips on how you manage it as an entrepreneur. These are questions that I'm really excited to answer and talk more in depth about when I have a podcast. I'm definitely going to bring my podcast back. You and are? Yeah. And I'll, Wait, since when? So someone actually asked me about my podcast on this Q&A and... Um, it's been brought up in a lot of meetings recently because on all of the meetings I've had recently I've talked about myself as a business owner and just how my brain works and how I run my business and like my goals and why like Why what I've done has led me to where I am now, whatever um, and I have a lot of conversations with my girlfriends that are in my industry about ways that I can help them and support them starting their dream brand or their dream um or make their dream product i don't know everything but i think i've learned so much as a creator who is a business owner i think that if you're a creator or if you even want to start a brand and you're not a creator there is such an opportunity right now in the economy for small brands long story short i was talking a lot about this and i and it got brought up to me a lot like would you ever go on a panel or a podcast and talk more about the business side of things? Because I think that if you watch my YouTube, I like will occasionally talk about these things, but I love having conversations with people who have like a potential to just blossom and create something and create something that they're really proud of. And I'm so grateful that I started something and just like gave it a shot and um, that I've learned, that I've failed, that I've had amazing things happen, you know, like all of the things that I want to push specifically young women to feel empowered to do things like that. Um, so anyways, I think as I get older, I can see myself stepping back into the podcast space to talk a little bit more about the business side of things and whether that's um, the brands that I will have started, Dairy Boy, Dairy Boy Home, um, Dairy Boy Kitchen, and like potentially other things that I start. Would love to talk about that, but also like what it's like um, being a content creator and 
everything that comes with that and how to navigate that and what that's taught me about myself, about the people I'm around, what it's taught me about the industry. And I would just love to talk about all that stuff more. And sometimes I don't come on here and talk about all that stuff that much. So I think one day or maybe soon I will talk about it more, but I literally didn't even answer the question. Um, it's definitely something I struggle with sometimes. I think um, my ADHD, my ADD has um, helped me in more ways that it's hurt me. I feel like it makes me more creative. I think it makes me also like a little bit more fun. And I feel like I'm a little bit more like lighthearted and free spirited because of that. Um, so there have been positive things. I also think... Sorry, this isn't both today. That's crazy. Wait, we have to go tomorrow morning. I think that with every sort of disability or thing like that, you just have to kind of try to find the positive things and also find ways to help yourself. I have systems that I've set up to help me stay organized, stay on my calendar. Um, I had to be really intentional about that. I have to be really intentional that everyone on my team knows me really well, knows my weaknesses and knows my strengths. And sometimes I can get distracted. I'm a pretty organized person, but sometimes I can be forgetful. Um, so I have people around me that are constantly holding me accountable and um, helping me. And I know not everyone has that because that's definitely not a luxury, but it's definitely, I mean, it is a luxury, but um, it's from like my brand. So yeah, helping yourself, knowing yourself, figuring out what works for you and actually implementing it. What helps you prevent a burnout? I love what I do and I do well and I'm happier, like a happier person when I'm working a lot. And I know that's not the case for everyone, but when I'm really busy and I'm stimulating myself creatively is when I'm the happiest. I guess now that I'm like talking about all this, I'm thinking back to a point where I was pretty burnt out. I was pretty burnt out making content in New York. Um, when I was living in New York, I didn't like any of my content. I wasn't taking care of myself or my health or my mental health or literally any aspect of my life, but I was not loving the content that I was creating. I didn't love where I was living. I didn't love any of my hobbies or like things I was doing. Um, I was working out just to like get out of the house. It really wasn't for like my health and wasn't cooking, just wasn't doing much. Um, so I guess you could say I felt burnt out living in New York in general. And then in turn, my content felt like I was burnt out. Someone asked, what do you do if you run out of content ideas? How do you get inspiration? Since my content, especially on YouTube, is so just like around my life. I've said this before on my channel, but being an individual is literally the most valuable thing as a content creator, like just being you. Because no matter what you do, there's always gonna be someone prettier, or richer, maybe more creative, whatever, all the things, but literally no one's you. So that's your, your superpower, is that no one's you, so for me, I don't feel like I need to be any more like anything but me. Like my life is my videos and this is literally my life. I like, this is very much like my real life and I don't run out of ideas because I just am filming like my life and my day-to-day -day life. And sometimes it's chiller and sometimes it's more crazy. and. Sometimes it's maybe more entertaining and sometimes it's not, but I never feel like that's a bad thing. I think people like seeing the natural ebbs and flows of what your life looks like. Some weeks you're at like a crazy grand slam or you're in London at Wimbledon and then some weeks I'm like literally just working in the office and making coffee and at my house and not doing as much. Um, but I think both of those content both of that content is valuable and I honestly think sometimes like my home content is more valuable because it's just more me. But another question that I get asked a lot that I'm like am not seeing right now but I just want to answer while I'm on this topic is that a lot of girls ask me how do you become a content creator when you don't like do much or you don't have a really um, busy life like maybe you work a normal job or you work a desk job and 
I honestly think we need more creators like that. I love watching hometown, chill, relaxing content. Everyone can make a 15 minute vlog of literally just their morning, literally just making your coffee, chatting with the camera, driving to work. I think that's much more relatable and cool. Also like get ready with me to go to work. Um, or talking about that if you have a dream or a goal to do something else, or if you want to start a brand, or that you've always wanted to start a YouTube channel. I think that's really relatable. Even if your channel is like literally you working a nine to five and like starting your YouTube channel and seeing where it takes you. Um, there is no person that can't start a YouTube. You know, everyone has an interesting story. Everyone's an individual and I think Again, that's your superpower and you don't have to be like everyone else. You don't have to be on the tennis store. You don't have to be really, really good at one thing. Like you could just be like, you know, in your hometown figuring it out still or going to college or whatever. It doesn't have to be like over the top entertaining and crazy. Um, I think people think that you have to be like a travel vlogger, jet setter in order to be a successful YouTuber, but I think Honestly, like I feel like a lot of people find that content really exhausting and not as relatable. I feel like my home content gets received and I connect better with my community through just like being chill. So just remembering that. How to know when to distance yourself from a friendship slash friend group. That's very easy for me to do because I have such a small inner circle of like best friends and naturally I spend a lot of time like alone or traveling. Uh, I'm, you know, in Connecticut. I'm not living in a major city, so I'm not like running into friend groups that I don't want to be around. I'm not like constantly like, fuck, I'm gonna have to like see this friend group that I don't get along with, which is really nice. It's a really nice part of getting older, honestly. But I think just like naturally distancing yourself um, and doing what's best for you. I know in your 20s or even in your teens from 15 to 16, it could feel like, the world is ending when you aren't friends with certain people or my camera died and I don't have another battery. So I just want to finish this video out and finish my thought. I was really lucky when I was younger to not have any really gnarly, horrible friend, friend falling out. But I kind of got into the real world and went to college and all of that. Um, I obviously dealt with clicks, mean girls, all the things. And I felt like very unequipped to deal with those sort of people. Um, and I felt like when I was like 18, um, it really felt like the world was ending and it felt like everyone was against me and that like, I don't know, it's just the worst when you're, you know, a young adult and you're losing friends or you're going through growing pains, just know that as a 25 year old who has really amazing relationships that it's not the end of the world and you're gonna look back and be so grateful that things happened the way that they did and that just like time heals everything and um, all you can do is acknowledge how you played a part in it and I think we can all take something from a situation like, no one handles everything perfectly and as long as you are constantly evolving and you are growing and you're learning from it um you won at the end of the day so yeah i hope you guys enjoyed this vlog and i will see you this week for another weekly vlog and then a christmas vlog 